So next I want to talk about some of the individual countries and go into a little bit more detail by looking at the different regions of South America, including the Caribbean North, the Indian West, the Southern Cone, and the country and region of Brazil. So in the Caribbean North, we have Colombia, Venezuela, and the three, what are called the three Guyanas. And including Venezuela, and one thing to note about Venezuela is Venezuela is one of the, it's an OPEC country. It's a major oil producer in the world. Um, however, the, even though they have a lot of resources that their country became completely dependent on the oil industry and used it to fund a lot of social programs, and when the price of oil fluctuated, it really sent shockwaves into their economy. And have, I don't know how up to date this is, but one time during the Venezuelan economic crisis, it would take this much cash to buy this much toilet paper. So the you know, implication that you might want to, you could use the cash instead. But, uh, and I'll include a video that kind of highlights some of this, these difficulties. Next door is Colombia. And Colombia is very mountainous, a lot of altitudinal zonation going on there. Has a long history of conflict, which is kind of calm today. Uh, but at one time, it had an insurgency uh, called the FARC, a, a rebel movement who um, had actually had control over large amounts of the country. And so um, this is showing two things, the rebel controlled areas and also areas where cocaine is grown. So there's kind of a mixture between uh, criminal uh, drug lords and also rebels that made it very difficult to govern. Um, the other three are the, what we call the three Guyanas. Uh, you have Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana. Suriname may be kind of like Dutch Guyana. So Guyana is a form of British colony, and these were colonies till fairly late, until the 60s and, and 70s. In fact, French Guyana is still a territory of France. So um, Guyana has, was formerly controlled by the British until the 60s. It has about 800,000 people, which is less than the population of Fresno County. Suriname is a former Dutch colony until the 1970s. It has about 500,000 people, which is about the population of Fresno. And French Guyana here is, you know, maybe half of the population of Fresno. So. Um, their populations are con just concentrated in some of the coastal areas. These were um, really plantation economies. A lot of people of, of different ethnic backgrounds who were of African and other ethnic backgrounds who were brought in to work on these plantations. So you can see the people really live on the coastal strip. So in a lot of ways, these three countries are a lot more like the islands in the Caribbean than they are like a big South American country because it's kind of like they're kind of, they're right there along the Caribbean edge. In the Andean West, this is where we have high indigenous populations. So for example, um, between Peru and Bolivia, about half of their populations are considered are, are indigenous people. Uh, you have Antiplano, something that we mentioned, and within, on those Antiplanos are high amounts of mineral resources. We'll watch a video about the, it's called the Rico Serra mine, but also new mineral resources such as lithium for, for things like uh, batteries, like for phones and Teslas and things like that. As we get into the Southern Cone, um, one, uh, let's, we'll kind of highlight a couple countries. This is Argentina over here. And most of their population is concentrated in this area called the Pampa. Uh, this is a kind of a you know subtropical grassland zone which with modern commercial agriculture so here we have agriculture which would probably look um, familiar to us from california as opposed to some type of subsistence agriculture large-scale massive commercial farming as we go further south the it becomes uh conditions become more harsh this is getting kind of closer down to antarctica and more kind of remote and more mountainous. So fewer people, colder environment, most of the economic activity is pastoralism or people doing things like sheep herding. And on the other side of the Andes Mountains, we have Chile. 
Now, Chile is very unique because of its, how far it extends north and south. It's what we call an elongated state, meaning it's very long compared to its width. And because it extends north and south, it has much different environments that in the north is the Atacama, the driest desert on earth. In the south, it conditions are like northern Canada, it's very cold. And in the middle, it has a Mediterranean climate, which is very much like California. Um, Chile is on the, what we call the Pacific Rim, that it has, it's on a part of the world where they can trade with other countries across the Pacific using things like containerized shipping. And I have a question that we try to look at and answer sometimes. What about Chile's location in the world gives it an advantage for agricultural exports? So we'll kind of dig into that to kind of illustrate a little bit of the, some of the geography. All right, so this is showing where we have Mediterranean climates in the world. We have them in California and Chile and a few other places in the world, but we're gonna highlight California versus Chile. Mediterranean climates are, by the way, these are also areas where you can have good wine, a good grape growing region. So Napa Valley, Southern, Southern Europe, Australia, South America, and also in Chile, they have, uh, they have a good climate for growing things like table grapes or wine grapes. I want to highlight some of the, a little bit of the, of the latitude here. The, um, this is about the latitude, extended latitude of California. This is off by a little bit. Just that here. This is, a, this is where California is in terms of its latitude. If you look at Chile, Chile is about the height, you know, is much higher north and south than California is. So this middle part of Chile here is about like the latitude of, of California up here. So that middle part has conditions very similar to California. In fact, if we kind of flip it around, um, it's kind of like the, the northern part of Chile, let me kind of go back. This northern part of Chile, the Atacama, it's kind of like the um, Baja California, very dry, um, but it's because of the, because it's extending further north where Baja is extending south. So the patterns are kind of mirroring each other. Right? If you go north, from California, you go up into Canada. If you go south, let me go back one, into the southern tip of South America, it's kind of like Canada as well. So the patterns that we see going north and south in North America are, the sim are similar but opposite in Chile. So the, the middle of Chile is a lot like California. And in fact, this is a, a good region. So like California is good for growing grapes, as is a lot of the Southern Cone, including Chile. Now, but one difference from California to Chile is California is up in the North and Northern Hemisphere and Chile is in the Southern Hemisphere. And because of that, their seasonal patterns are different. So in California, it gets hot in June and August. This is like the good, you know, grow, you know, growing time of the year. Now, because of the Southern Hemisphere has opposite seasons, their growing time of the year is going to be like in January and December. So during what we, what during our winter, is their summer. So one economic advantage that they have is that they can grow the crops that California can grow, but they can grow them on the opposite time of the year when we can't. So. Sometimes if you go into a store, you might find table grapes that are grown in Chile and it might seem odd that you're in California and eating grapes from Chile, but it may be because it's that time of the year when we're not growing them, but they are. And that's the question we talked about their location in the world that gives an advantage is location in the Southern hemisphere with the opposite seasons. A couple of notes about Brazil. Brazil has a high amount of, of urban to rural migration where you have massive amount of people moving from the poor areas into the cities 
And because of that, you, one unique part of their physical environment is that many of the cities include what are called favelas. These are informal formal or self-built settlements on the outskirts of cities. Um, in Spanish-speaking countries, they're often called barrios. Or, and, but in Portuguese-speaking country like Brazil, it's called favelas. So these are, can be massive urban areas outside of them um, that are not really planned. They're just kind of built one structure at a time by people building them themselves. We call them informal settlements. Another thing about Brazil is that Brazil is part of a, some of the sort of newly emerging countries of the world, like China. And so BRICS is an acronym that sounds, stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Initially, it was South Africa wasn't included, it kind of got tacked on later. So it was BRICS with lowercase s, and since the s was there, they included South Africa. Um, these are kind of like the um, economies that had been more uh, doing poorly in the past, but kind of started emerging fairly recently in the late 1900s. Um, though they haven't all grown equally, China has really surpassed all of them. Um, but Brazil is kind of one of these sort of new economies as well. I'll include a video that talks more about BRICS. All right, so this is showing the, the wealth of geography, a little bit, a little bit old, but it's a bit poor in the north, richer in the south. This, there's this little kind of dot here, and I want to kind of zone in on that for a moment. That is the capital of Brazil called Brasilia. So it's kind of weird because if you look at like populations, just about everybody in Brazil lives near the coast. Now there's a few little spots in the interior, but this is the capital which they intentionally moved into the interior of the country. And it was really a symbolic move because it was meant to kind of unify the interior with the coastal area where most of the people live. So in the fairly recently, late 60s, 70s, them, they actually created a brand new capital in the interior of the country. And when you move, make your cap, country's capital where it is for a symbolic reason, that's called a forward capital. And then one last note is the, the shape of countries. We mentioned Chile being an elongated state. And that elongated term is part of what's called state to territorial configurations, which we will talk about in the future. So in Southeast Asia, we can talk about Vietnam also being an elongated state. However, Cambodia, because it's more of a compact, country is called a compact shape. So in South America, we, ha we have Chile as an elongated country, but by contrast, Uruguay here is a compact country. 